Hello, I'm Francis Ely from Enfield Climate Action Forum, and I'd like to introduce you to the second workshop we're doing on carbon literacy. We did the first workshop where we looked at the science of climate change, and in this one we take it further and look at the immediacy and urgency of climate change, and then look at the En-ROAD simulation that will help us get some idea of what actions we can take to make a difference. And again, this workshop is presented by Ali Hassami. So let's go over to him now. Okay. Um, good evening, folks. Uh, I'm Ali Hassami. I have the honor and pleasure of uh, knowing most of you who are participating tonight. And uh, the idea behind um, this presentation is as I explained in the first round last week, is a kind of a social experimentation to see whether there is a possibility to bring reasonably complex scientific material uh, to generate value at local level. Uh, we spent the first talk largely on the principles and the origins of climatic change in the atmospheric context. And uh, I'm hoping that this session would largely uh, <clears throat> take us towards uh, some form of remediation and actions we can take. And that is the <clears throat> experimental bit, if you like, because much of what we discussed was largely driven by science and uh, <clears throat> I'm indebted to multiplicity of sources from MIT, Climate Primer material, to the Met Office, to NASA, providing much of the material that I have used. There is a bit left over that I like to uh, finish uh, because that sets the scene for going into En-ROADS and, in a sense, justifying the context of En-ROADS. Why? Why do we need such a tool? Is it <clears throat> basically a toy to play with and draw on, or is it more serious? And what implications, if any, has it got for our local community? I'm representing UNA, Enfield and Barnets. <clears throat> I raised this uh, collaboration with NCAF a while ago with Francis, who is uh, really the organizer of the event, and I'm grateful for his energies and uh, endless <laughs> attention to all these details. I'm often baffled by <clears throat> his endless energy that he spends on social matters. And then there is also an institution that I'm a, I've been a member of and I used to lead in the UK called IEEE, and I'm hoping should we wish to continue with this initiative and we believe is generating local value for us, we would hopefully <clears throat> get some support from this global institution, which is a technology-based institution. Um, so I'd like to uh, basically finish off the remaining bits, but I've done some updates. As you have noticed, climate has been pretty much on uh, in the news uh, since we finished last week's presentation. So. Things are evolving, things are changing. Likelihood is uh, from now on, it would be a staple diet of newscasting uh, environments to show forest fires and extreme weather events, et cetera, all because of what we are <clears throat> uh, concerned about. So we uh, painted the origin of climatic change and said <clears throat> uh, there are 10,000 uh, year cycles for Earth to get hot and cold and go into deep frost. But uh, since early 1900s, we have seen a different cause for this. And this cause is actually fighting against this 10,000 year cycle uh, <clears throat> in the sense that called Milankovitch orbital cycle. That's in a sense all driven by high concentration of CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And it was only uh, early July that we started receiving massive uh, rises, almost unprecedented levels of uh, temperature rise, 
on daily average air temperature against uh, a massive uh, <clears throat> amount of statistics that we've been collecting since the war. And 17.08 uh, degree was re uh, reached in early July. In fact, when we look at the surface temperature <clears throat> compared with that <clears throat> average, we can see that there are areas even five degrees warmer than the average recorded between 85 and 93. So the Earth is showing very strange, largely warming characteristics, as well as the <clears throat> um, marine heat wave. We are also not only getting high temperatures um, as average rise in the global Earth surface temperature, the ocean temperatures are also uh, smashing uh, the records and we are getting seasonal rises uh, five degrees above what it should be. Now, ocean temperature rising five degree is a massive threat to sustainability of life in uh, <clears throat> Uh, micro, uh, all the organisms uh, in the ocean. But the interesting thing to bear in mind, we are not just losing fish as a result. Uh, marine ecosystem generates half of our oxygen around the world. So we destroy that ecosystem. We are basically <clears throat> attacking our own lifeblood here. And uh, also the fact that the Ice, uh, sea ice, uh, Antarctic uh, levels are dropping to lowest levels that we have seen. Uh, something the so 10 times the size of UK is vanished in the <clears throat> Arctic uh, sea ice. And it's uh, the drop in level uh, is really not just uh, accidental exceedance of certain parameters. 10 times the, the land mass of UK is a huge amount that's never been seen in the recorded history. So this is uh, more or less <clears throat> even less than the biggest drops we have anticipated recently. We had uh, quotations that the hottest days on Earth almost in the last 100,000 years were experienced. These are average temperatures, not local temperatures. Uh, early July, from 6 to 9, uh, at least three of those uh, were the hottest temperatures recorded. That affects multiplicity of uh, facets of life, from the health and well-being to biodiversity to marine life, uh, five-degree temperature rise in the oceans, even scarcity of water and its security of food, as well as harm done to city infrastructure, etc. We have seen some of these, so I'll skip those and uh, just dwell on the <clears throat> the ones which are more recent up to the uh, updates since last week. Um, so in a sense, uh, we can see uh, the damage done and it's almost uh, in spite of the fact that there are vested interests, uh, oil interests, uh, gas industry, etc., uh, it's undeniable that this is a man-made thing and it's likely also to lead to sea level rise. I have shown you some of these in the previous lecture, so I'll skip these, including acidification of the oceans uh, with a much higher carbonic acid concentration, which basically, again, damages the marine ecosystem. So high temperature is one, CO2 uh, uh, being more or less <clears throat> dissolved in the ocean uh, water is the second problem. And obviously consequences as we are witnessing, even on a daily basis, range from droughts to uh, floods, to uh, massive uh, uncontrolled fires. And the interesting thing is that if we come to our senses internationally, not just nationally here, these concentrations are not going to vanish or fade away in short periods of time. The high concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is 
400 parts per million per volume is going to last till about the year 3000. So these are not short term effects that we are going to encounter. And the same goes with temperatures. Temperatures are not going to take a nosedive as soon as we all become pious and start using uh, <coughs> hydro uh, hydrocarbons and uh, re reducing emissions. Uh, what NASA is doing, for example, they are monitoring CO2 around the globe uh, with satellites. And here's an image of uh, CO2 concentration. You can see that in extremities, it is 430 parts per million. All of these are well above expected levels. They were expected to be around 350 or so. So these instruments are, and these measurements and these claims are all driven by data. They're not personal opinions. They are not political uh, maneuvering or positioning. So what the scientists are doing trying to get a few vital signs of the planet and the observation. This is carbon dioxide concentration, average global temperature, amount of methane in the atmosphere, uh, as you have seen, uh, drop in Arctic ice, um, ice sheets, sea level rise, and temperature rise in the ocean, which as I... Uh, elaborated recently uh, was reported as five degrees warmer that it should be. So these are typically the vital signs that are under observation by various means. And unfortunately, most of these indicators are going in the wrong direction. Now, we have looked at uh, what can we do about it. And that's where I want to converge towards the use and utility of a climate simulator that typically uh, the scientists believe before we really lose it, we have around about 600 gigatons budget for carbon dioxide to emit. After that, then uh, heaven knows uh, whatever threshold we might exceed and the system may not just gently get warmer we may get uh, exceedance uh, of the threshold suddenly turning into unstoppable uh, series of what they call in science positive feedback. That is something causes, say, temperature rise, temperature then rise, uh, gives rise to more of that thing, such as <clears throat> uh, defrosting of permafrost in the um, northern hemisphere, that releases methane, more methane, which is a strong greenhouse gas, then rises the temperature, and then that gives rise to more methane. So we are in a reasonably tight span of time in terms of action, as well as how long have we got to do. There are various solutions. There are three classes of solutions in terms of what we can do, and the simulator takes us in that direction, and I sincerely hope by the time we finish tonight, you all get a right feel about <clears throat> what are the fundamental things open to humanity, frankly, to save the planet for sake of future generation, and indeed ourselves. Uh, obviously, reduction of emissions that would have been the primary instrument is now, as you have seen, due to very uh, high rates of emission not uh, a very successful enterprise. We are, uh, we have failed globally to commit to even agreements made under uh, various uh, climate <clears throat> conferences, COP, uh, uh, even the Paris Agreement of one and a half, maximum two is now becoming a reality. The other solution is whether there is something, a science called climate engineering. Is there anything we, we can do now that we have not managed to come to a consensus on which nation pays for reduction of emissions? How quickly can we go to renewables? How quickly can we drop our old habits of using gas and oil and coal? I'll give you a few <clears throat> examples of uh, climate engineering. Some of these are very risky because they've never been tried. 
And once we start them, we may not be able to stop them, unfortunately. So that's one danger. There was a recent study in Europe and the scientists uh, came to the view that um, there is, uh, as part of <clears throat> climate engineering, we can resort to large scale carbon capture and sequestration or CCS. And that means basically capture carbon from the source that is creating it and uh, liquefy it and pump it into caverns under the seawater so that it stays there and out of mischief in the atmosphere. This report that I'm re talking to, talking about in uh, climate engineering was only published early July. So there is a strong favor <clears throat> in Europe to try and resort to uh, CCS, carbon capture sequestration solutions. The other one, just as an illustration of what kind of climate engineering is likely to be open to us, was a debate we've had about what's called a solo, solar uh, geoengineering. And here we are trying to use aerosols to uh, pump calcium carbonate, which is a compound you find in limestone and typical, uh, typically the, the chalk we use in the classroom or we used to use in the classroom. Uh, these particles act like micro mirrors and would start uh, deflecting the sun ray. And that way we reduce the amount of energy, uh, thermal energy infrared received at the Earth's surface uh, in order to <clears throat> minimize the impact. So we came all the way to, there are various solutions, but uh, frankly, the, the wisest thing is to try and have a scientific understanding of their effectiveness. It's not just adequate to say, how about going to the, down the path of carbon capture or uh, <clears throat> solar geoengineering, Unfortunately, the risks of this geoengineering is not fully explored. So if we release these aerosols into the atmosphere, we may not be able to compensate. So it's a bit of a hit and miss, and there's no one who has a precise understanding of what if it didn't quite work or things went wrong. So there came uh, a form of scientific estimation or forecasting, and that is called climate simulation. Uh, a group of scientists um, <clears throat> in an uh, organization called Climate Interactive joined forces with a major US university called MIT <clears throat> and uh, put together an N roads uh, climate simulator. N road, unfortunately, the N doesn't stand for Enfield. I wish it did. It actually uh, stands for energy, and it the simulator is uh, basically energy rapid overview and decision support. So that is the title of this simulator. Instead of just calling it a generic name they have created a specific name for it. So what I like to do now is to switch to the actual simulator. And as they say, without further ado, go to the <clears throat> real McCoy and show the real machine that we want to uh, explore tonight. This simulator is a scientific tool. It's almost like a climate calculator. It gives, as the name implies, it gives a rapid overview. So you come up with a question, if I did this, what do I get? And it calculates in the background. It's run entirely on the web. So you don't need a separate calculator. You don't need a separate computer or software library of uh, mathematical things. All of those mathematics is hidden behind the Enroads engine. And the developers are sharing it free of any expectation with the global community. It is not an exclusive tool and it probably reveals uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the truth as close as what's often referred to as best available science. 
the mechanics, the equations, the data are all in the open. And I'll show you examples of where you can get hold of it. Every one of you participating or watching the video later can access this, can play with it. But in truth, it is not a toy. It is a scientific tool designed to help serious thinking about what are our options. We are getting to the edge of this climatic precipice and it is time we were smart rather than just think of recycling our plastic or reducing um, our energy consumption. As you have noted and you see from daily news items, things are not quiet. Um, that benign to be ignored. And the final thing about the <clears throat> En-ROADS or Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support as Climate Model or Simulator is that it gets updated all the time as and when science evolves, as and when we discover what happens to a warm ocean, when we discover how does economic growth impact on energy consumption, how much energy consumption impacts on CO2 emissions, et cetera. These are not exactly written in the books. They are sometimes empirical science. They are understanding based on data collection and theorizing and understanding and then converting these to equations that give us views of the future rather than what we have witnessed today. So ultimately, a simulator or a model is there to support our options about how to handle this with a reasonable amount of precision rather than somebody's guesswork or some politician's uh, biased view or somebody from a given um, vested interest industry uh, in hydrocarbons industry, uh, hydrocarbons industry telling us, don't worry about it. Uh, all of this is fake. It's all under control, et cetera. So it's been updated early June where they have actually enhanced the, uh, the way economy interacts with the uh, climate as well as its ultimate impact on the temperature rise. So here is the actual uh, simulator. I'd like to uh, take you through it so that you develop a deeper understanding and then we share the uh, link and um, Francis can do that through the chat box and we will put that on uh, NCAF uh, website. So anyone who's interested, uh, my intent tonight is to use the rest of the time till about seven o'clock to fundamentally introduce why this model is of value to humanity and its timing, its precision, its universality, its independence from vested interest, political or uh, commercial, is all the virtues we have needed all the time to actually get our act together rather than read books or follow a big opinion. And this is a collective uh, effort of many scientists, and he uses data from all sorts of sources, from UN published data, individual country published data on transportation, on the energy usage, on land usage, etc. His real talent is to integrate real world global data verified by sources and trustworthiness, and then try and make sense of so what do these data tell us uh, about what we are facing and where are we going? That's the challenge. So we're not looking behind, we are looking ahead. Right, let's start with the, uh, the displays or the graphs that we get here. Uh, this particular graph is showing uh, sources of primary energy from uh, uh, you can see from the scale, uh, the deep brown is coal and then energy produced by uh, oil consumption. And then we've got gas and re renewables. And you can see the renewables are expanding in proportion to the others, the remaining reasonably static. And then we've got uh, bioenergy and uh, <clears throat> 
nuclear, et cetera, you can see those in uh, smaller proportions. If you um, want to see these graphs in more detail, you can open it um, as a larger display and then it's easier to make sense of it. If you put your cursor on any one of these bands, it tells you basically the <clears throat> amount of energy and the various um, parameters associated with that um, in more detail. So that side is basically a selectable um, range of graphs we can see. So this is not the only graph that the simulator can show you. It is one of the more popular versions. On the right hand <laughs> side, we often end up uh, seeing the net temperature rise forecast over the next century or the century we are in. Um, temperature <clears throat> uh, eventually uh, the current forecast uh, on the so-called baseline forecast is 3.3 degrees or close to 6 degrees uh, centigrade or 6 degrees Fahrenheit temperature rise by 2100 if we didn't do anything compared with everything that we have done until now. So the current body of parameters, data, initiatives, subsidies, et cetera, are all taken on board and they generate what they call a baseline. So the baseline says, as of today in 2023, if we didn't do anything else, if we continued using our cars and uh, heated our homes and didn't increase the energy efficiency of our homes and our factories and our cars, we are expecting to see 3.3 .3 degrees temperature rise in about um, 80 years time, uh, 77 years time. Of course, there was a very pertinent question uh, last week in the sense that this looks too linear, too smooth. What about threshold? What if, for example, the rise, another one degree rise, suddenly put into motion uncontrollable events. And those uncontrollable events generated what I refer to as positive feedback or feeding on themselves. And we basically suddenly ended up getting well beyond this much earlier. And judging from the way we have approached the Paris Agreement of one and a half degrees, that is now by most experts, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, we only got four, five years to reach that level. And that was supposed to be 2050. So we are cutting that, uh, achieving these uh, undesirable uh, temperatures much earlier than we had anticipated. Now, so there are various forms of graphs. I'll show you quite a few uh, popular ones. Uh, <clears throat> but generally, the intent of this simulator is what happens to temperature, because that is the bottom line. No matter, uh, of course, CO2 or other uh, greenhouse gas concentrations, as I have covered in the earlier talk, are all contributory to that, but so are other sources. The model fundamentally classifies the sources and contributors to temperature rise in six groups. One group is about where our energy comes from and how much of various sources do we use, how much coal, how much oil. And uh, as you can see in this uh, y-axis in the sources of energy or primary energy is actually shown in amount of energy rather than tons of oil or cubic meters of gas. And exajoules, for those who are interested, is 10 to the power of 18 joules of energy. So this is how much 10 to the power of 18 joules, 300 times 10 to the power of 18 
which means 300 million, million, million joules of oil is being consumed. And the same, roughly the same proportions for amount of energy we are consuming in the form of uh, natural gas. Uh, also, luckily, we are seeing a massive rise in the amount of renewables. And of course, the effect of renewables is that the more of those and the more affordable they become, the less of these greenhouse uh, generating uh, energy sources uh, we are going to use. Now, six classes, I'd like to quickly take you through. My initial ambition was to actually do some workshop together. Maybe we do some trial activity, but uh, if there was interest, uh, frankly, it would be insufficient time today or uh, tonight to actually go through a comprehensive review of these six classes that are sources of influence on temperature rise. One class is energy supply. And the model has got equations and data to see, uh, to incorporate in the forecast for temperature rise, how much uh, coal we are using, how much renewables we are generating, how much oil we are using, how much nuclear, natural gas, uh, so-called new zero carbon forms of <clears throat> uh, fuels that do not generate carbon, then energy generated by uh, biosources, and also a, mechani a mechanism for controlling the amount of carbon people do, such as carbon pricing or carbon tax. So those eight instruments are grouped under energy supply, and you'll see the uh, individuals. We're we'll going to play with those a bit later. So one major source, and because this model is called energy rapid overview, it is largely uh, driven by uh, dominance of what type and how much of which energy we are using and what is that telling us. And of course, its forecasts between the year 2000 and 2100 are based on global data that economy needs this much, the size of the population, the uh, food production, et cetera. They are not just assumptions, although there are some assumptions. Somewhere. The second big contributor to emissions of uh, uh, greenhouse gases, which then translate into greenhouse effect and temperature rise is transportation sector. And in transportation sector, the model looks at the amount that we can electrify transportation from aviation to uh, rail transport to electrification of cars, as well as how much can we enhance their efficiency. So these are the instruments that model allows um, people who are manipulating parameters for uh, decision-making to play with, and it immediately computes the impact. The third category of influencing factors are the energy efficiency of buildings and emissions uh, from industry and how much can be reduced through electrification. So the same as impact of electrification on transportation is taken on board in the model, the impact of electrification in industry and moving away from burning <clears throat> gas or uh, coal or oil in uh, huge boilers and industrial plant, it is that kind of thing. Then um, the interesting uh, parameter is uh, element of growth. And growth has got uh, two dimensions. One is about population. The other one is about a state of global economy. Population growth is obviously around 8 billion, close to 8 billion now, and there are forecasts to reach uh, by 2100, close to 11 billion or just under 11 billion. And of course, the correlation is that the more people are there on Earth, the more food they need, 
the more energy they need to keep themselves uh, cool in the summer and warm in the winter, and that leads to increase in emission. The economic growth factor is a slightly different in the sense that the, the more growth we get economically or we chase by investing in the right instruments, uh, we are going to get more energy used. The energy then generates emissions and those some of those emissions are greenhouse gases and they lead again to temperature rise. So this is the fourth category of uh, if you like, elements of influence on rising temperature of the earth. Two final categories of influencing factors used in the En-ROADS model are emissions that have origin in land, food production, and in industry emissions. Uh, of course, uh, you all know that um, the deforestation as we hear in say Latin America and Brazil etc have been major factors uh, people are chasing those for economic gain and cattle raising and uh, go prospecting for gold and minerals uh, without an iota of care for the global impact so deforestation uh, as you can see on the scale is actually done significant amount of damage. The location of these dots on the scale that is there for uh, more or less selection is called the um, baseline. This is where we are with deforestation and we have already taken on board all the effect of the past deforestation, etc. The other one on industry emissions and land and food emission in terms of what kind of fertilizers we use, how much cattle we raise. They all generate methane and some other greenhouse gases that have an influence. And interestingly, there is also this geoengineering solutions built into the forecasting model, which deal with carbon removal. Uh, if you remember the illustration of what I call carbon capture and sequestration, which is basically grabbing carbon out of air or out of exhaust fumes or power stations and factory uh, <clears throat> generators, etc., liquefying it, pumping it into caverns under the seabed and hoping that it stays there and uh, doesn't contribute to further global warming. In a sense, uh, keep hiding the issue under the carpet, uh, but the assumption is that if we pump it in there, it's never going to leak, uh, which is uh, amongst many other assumptions that uh, could come back and bite us and surprise us. So carbon removal is the final category. How much carbon removal can we do? And there are two fundamental mechanisms for removing carbon. One is to do with afforestation, which means basically growing as much vegetation and trees as possible. So model actually calculates if you grow this much trees, considering how long it takes for a tree to grow and mature and more or less get into photosynthesis, etc., and absorb fair amount of carbon in uh, forming a trunk. Um, that is one influencing factor. The other one is the technological or what I referred to earlier on as geoengineering technology solutions. These technology solutions exist. They're not particularly cheap, but they are doable. And as I alluded to, the recent study published early June in Europe tended to indicate that if we can't meet our zero <clears throat> emissions targets in Europe, uh, carbon removal through geoengineering uh, and sequestration is definitely one of the solutions that Europe is looking at very keenly. Uh, it's not science fiction. It just requires enormous machines to grab liquefy and transport carbon instead of transport water or gas through pipelines. Right, so there are six sources of influence 
uh, many forms of data uh, display. Uh, and I now going to take you through some illustrations. There won't be enough time in uh, tonight's talk, considering we were trying to stick to one hour to actually do what we had uh, originally stated to see whether we can start identifying which one of these levers uh, lend themselves to local control. Say, what can we do about energy supply in Enfield? What can we do about transport in Enfield and Barnets? What can we do about buildings, uh, food, uh, carbon removal, etc. But of course, some of these are um, mega scale operations only available to global governments and huge investment. The others, we were hoping that it would at least shine some light in terms of for us as concerned and motivated citizens to do something honorable for sake of uh, saving the environment for current and future generations, there may be some virtue in some of these. So I'm going to choose one of these just to illustrate uh, the subsets of controls that you get in the model that actually allows you to experiment. And we do this together because frankly, uh, the effects that you get, the forecast, as you see, top right-hand side graph, which shows uh, gigatons of equivalent CO2 per year, which ultimately translates in 3.3 degrees by 2100, you would see the effect by uh, looking at what if we just put all our eggs in the basket of renewables, cut coal, oil, uh, and natural gas consumption, I don't know, by 90%. These are all possible. Of course, these are not all feasible. As we have seen, there is still, in spite of all the things that is hitting us on a daily basis in the news items, there's still no major panic globally by responsible or irresponsible governments, if one might say, to do anything about it. There is no rush to convene uh, the next uh, COP earlier, two months earlier, because this is now a global emergency. And there doesn't seem to be a great deal of response from any uh, institution, individual governments, local authorities, etc. Of course, there are plans about and there are initiatives, but none of those initiatives seem to be on par with recognition of a scale of emergency that the data shows us. Um, so let's go down the path of playing uh, with one or two of these policy or action instruments. As you uh, heard, the model is a decision support. So decision is what us humans, concerned humans, uh, hopefully our governments, people with uh, access to resources and capital make, and the model can demonstrate to them what bank they would get for the box they invest. And this is as credible and as scientific, as uh, truthful as it gets. It's not based on someone's whims and wishes and biases or misunderstanding of how climate as a system uh, works. Because if you go back to Lovelock's uh, Gaia theory, that the Earth is a living system, it, it actually regulates itself. This model is near thing to that Gaia theory. All the influences of a living regulating ecosystem are built into these six classes of influence. And of course, concern is what is the temperature? Tell us where the money is. And our concern here, tell us what the temperature effect is if we did a series of actions. And you can compound these actions. You don't need to just go and say, what would happen if I reduced coal consumption by 50%? You can say, I'm going to focus in terms of my abilities at governmental level. Maybe all of these are permissible. 
at the local uh, um, council level, maybe only a handful of these parameters are easy to manipulate. The rest are well beyond the resources of a local community or, or county council to even begin to handle. And the final point I would make before we jump and play with some of these parameters and before we run out of time is this model is a global level model. It hasn't got an instrument to say, okay, if this is the forecast for uh, the entire air surface temperature rise compared with the pre-industrial average, can you give me a fraction of it for Enfield? Can you give me a fraction of it for Scotland? Or what is, uh, I don't know, share of Southeast England of all of these? That mechanism is not here. This is a global model dealing with huge amount of complexity, but it hasn't got the resolution then to attribute the net effect, either harm or benefit at a localized um, location, so to speak. So let's start with playing with oil uh, as, a, uh, as an example. So we want to uh, play with oil. So we get a whole new panel open and say, these are the things that you can influence if you want to play with influence of oil on earth temperature rise. First of all, how much tax or subsidy would you like to put on oil production? Do you want to subsidize it so that people get a incentive to generate more oil and pour more of this harmful carbohydrate, uh, hydrocarbon uh, into the atmosphere, or do you want to start taxing it? So that's, as you can imagine, can be an instrument that uh, both either local government or central government uh, can resort. And let's have a look at the parameters, and then we have a go through a quick consultation on what we think. Then it allows us to say, most policy instruments uh, are really timed in the sense that as soon as you decide, you can't do it tomorrow. There are many contracts, many conventions, many rules that uh, do, do not allow even a government to immediately jump on a policy uh, instrument straight away. So it can say, all right, which year would you like to start applying this subsidy or this additional tax you want to put on fuel? Um, then it can even, uh, by default, it says, I assume that you don't want to stop this. I uh, assume that it's 2100, but you may decide that we want to experiment with 10 year period. Between 23 and 33, we want to slap on some oil tax. Let's see what effect do we get. Uh, what is the net benefit, if you like? Then the other thing is reduce reduction in oil infrastructure. Uh, you may decide that if we then slap on a tax, maybe it's smart to keep reducing the oil infrastructure. And it uh, obviously infrastructure uh, starts from oil wells all the way to distribution to uh, ultimate uh, consumption, etc. So if you say, I want to reduce my investment in <clears throat> new oil infrastructure. We don't want to go and explore oil in the North Sea anymore. We're not looking for any fresh sources, uh, etc. Then we can uh, play with that parameter. Then again, it gives uh, an end year for your reduction of uh, <clears throat> or stoppage of investment in new oil infrastructure. Then you may also say uh, we may put some form of <clears throat> control on oil utilization, that we don't want anyone, uh, any industry, for example, to increase production by using more oil. So whatever machinery they use, burning coal or, coal or oil may be subject to that overall reduction. And then it has a start year and end year. And obviously, these are then uh, the amount of energy <clears throat> demand uh, from oil 
as forecast and this dark line in the blue and the scenario is in, uh, sorry, the dark line in black and the scenario is in blue. At the moment, we haven't played with any parameter regarding how we want to reduce our dependence and utilization of oil. So the baseline, which shows the current forecast and computation by this model and the scenario is the same. So this is a starting point. Let's uh, have a go at this. As you can see, each parameter has got, um, each category uh, of these six has got number of subcategories. Each subcategory has got something like three to 10 parameters. So playing with all of these is gonna take a fair amount of time. And frankly, uh, my ambition is if people think uh, going down this path uh, and exploring what options are open to the local community based on this best available science rather than somebody's book or somebody's promise, more than happy to continue with future sessions on this. So let's start. Uh, at the moment, units are, because this is a US model in dollars. So uh, throw in a number for what we would be doing if we, uh, first of all, do we want to subsidize oil production or do we want to tax it? And if we want to tax it, um, how much do you want to slap on a barrel of oil? Just hazard a guess. Let's make a start on this. Let's tax it. Tax it. Good. So that's the right direction in terms of policy. Just throw in a number which doesn't kill, uh, um, I don't know, the industry, because obviously wherever you add tax, a lot of people get shortchanged and have to pay higher prices for everything. So th anyone uh, hazard a guess on how much tax per barrel? How many dollars? Ten. Ten dollars. So uh, in a sense, uh, you can see this is... Uh, the same scale. So this um, scale here can take us up to around about uh, close to $85. And you can see the effect on oil energy demand that with that level per barrel of oil, we probably almost half the amount of heat generated as a result of oil consumption. And that's just one instrument. That's only one policy. But given that we decided not to be too dramatic about this and stock to $10 per barrel, we keep that instrument that you can see the model is currently saying the scenario you are painting for yourself and you started playing with one parameter is already showing some positive return. So the net amount of exajoules per year from oil energy source is dropped because you slapped on $10 uh, per barrel of oil. So we assume we want to start it um, this year. When do you think we want to stop? Do you want to give it a period of experimentation or do we want to just carry on slapping on that $10, et cetera? Any, any guesswork? Permanent. Permanent. So we leave that at uh, 2100 because that's the limit of calculation of the model. So the other thing is reducing the oil infrastructure, uh, new oil infrastructure. Do we want to basically cut every investment in a new oil well or oil facility or oil refinery or et cetera? Or do we want to be more gentle and say, all right, we uh, start in 2025, we want to reduce oil infrastructure, which basically is based on money, considering what it's doing to us by X amount. Any rough idea of how much percentage in reduction it would be desirable to do, remembering that everything that we do imposes cost on somebody. Some industry goes under because it can no longer for example, support people. 
And if we don't have enough renewables, then there would be a shortage of energy, for example. So there is all sorts of implications. And this model has got all those relationships and implications built in. So anyone with a guess on percentage reduction in new oil infrastructure? So how about 50% by 2035? Why don't we do 50%? look at the uh, net effect of our current scenario that two policy instruments, one to do with adding some tax to existing oil consumption and letting it run, and the other one making a commitment, obviously this is at the governmental and national level, of 50% reduction in in investment in new, remember it's new, nothing about existing oil wells and refineries, et cetera. Already we have halved the net amount of energy produced by oil consumption by virtually uh, 50% towards the end of the um, century. You can also begin to see on a, a macro scale that uh, the blue line is deviating from the black line. Black line is telling us the so-called baseline where we are today. The blue line shows us the impact based on the combination of policy actions that we agree to do. So uh, we begin uh, in 2025 and drop uh, any new investment by 50% and uh, that's it. Um, Right. Then we have reduction in how much oil we use. How much do we want to cut back on our dependency on oil? Are we going to just keep on going the way we are, but not increase it? Do we want to be more ambitious and I don't know, drop it by 1% a year or 5% a year, et cetera? Um, so Let's have a guess on percentage reduction in utilization of oil to run our industry, to run our shipping, to run our aircraft, etc. As you can imagine, when you think on a macro scale, things are not that simple to cut back in large quantities. Any rough idea? Maybe 5% a year. Why not? Let's go for, we want to drop this by 5% you notice that it made virtually uh, no impact. So we started a small amounts of reduction. Let's see the maximum effect because uh, of course, larger reductions are reducing the total energy. And remember these mean continuing to keep this all the way. So it's um, massive impact and look at the top graph that shows the net temperature rise. We already dropped the global temperature rise by 0.1 degree if we commit ourselves to close to 40% drop in oil utilization, as well as, so it also shows what is the share of oil in rise in temperature. So there are so many things there, so many other greenhouse gases and just, two or three policy instruments. So let's um, make this say 30%. So we are making a commitment that we reduce, of course, remember, this is a global commitment, not just uh, UK. So uh, all the others, uh, we need to have uh, good friends to persuade them at the UN level uh, for sake of prosperity and well-being and peace. Let's uh, commit to this. And what do you think the reaction of the oil producing states going to be to this? It's going to be seen as a conspiracy and there are going to be obviously opponents. So many of these are not simple, but we are just uh, playing with this concept. Then there is um, start year, this year, and we let it go 30% till 2100. So basically just playing with one component um, of policy actions that are feasible from adding tax or subsidy to reducing the amount of investment in the same sector, 
such as oil sector, new investment, not the ones that are already being done, to amount that we want to cut back on usage, uh, has had massive forecast for uh, basically a factor of 400% or 100%, uh, 80% to 100%, close to 100% in roughly 70 years. So that's the simulator. And uh, if we actually uh, tell it to play this for us, it says, this is uh, what you get. You ask for uh, change in oil and the simulator says you have modified some parameters and uh, this is the display of this single source of energy uh, that has been modified by you in terms of various policy decisions that you have made. Of course, as we have explained, all of these decisions are hugely interrelated with uh, some form of harmony and agreement with other global partners who may decide they are in the gross phase of industrial uh, um, development. They have no desire to reduce oil consumption, et cetera. So these are where our problems are, frankly. Now, the model says, you get your act together, you get your agreements together. I can tell you what benefit you get. And all that commitment on the oil only helped us reduce the temperature by 0.1 degree at the most 70 years later. So not a, uh, in spite the massive commitment that we drop the oil adoption and consumption by 30%, we only get 0.1 degree uh, reduction in temperature rise. The rest of this uh, would take enormous amount of time. My ambition was uh, if there was interest and desire to explore all these six classes of parameters for deciding which one of these lend themselves to local action, uh, use of renewables, uh, I don't know, dro dropping consumption of natural gas, et cetera, we would spend uh, time together, maybe either August or September, as if there is interest by all means, I'm more than happy to come back we collectively go together and see whether we can come up with a balanced scenario rather than a fictitious scenario that we invented here for a series of actions that can be supported and we can even see its global impact. That is, we can assume if the actions that we are considering feasible for Enfield and Barnett, for example, uh, assuming everyone else sticks to that, we can sell it to others as hugely beneficial, see what's the net contribution to global uh, emissions and associated temperature rise going to be. I think it's best to stop here because we've reached the usual time. I apologize, I exceeded a bit, but overall you begin to see that all those complications, all those um, unfortunate forecasts for uh, damage to eco uh, ocean ecosystem uh, and fish and corals, etc., to ice layers, to average temperature rise on Earth, that has all those things that we see on the news from forest fires, uncontrollable flash fires, to uh, extremities of winds and tornadoes and uh, <clears throat> droughts and so on. And the final thing, if you remember from the previous talk, is a forecast that doesn't fit this model, and that is uh, global instability. The uh, scientists believe that the temperature rise is going to give rise to massive migration pressures. People are not going to sit and perish, so they would be tempted to move towards greener pastures and you never know, UK may become an ideal holiday destination because Southern Europe is basically baking too hot and uh, people may search for more temperate climates rather than go for the sun in summer. So you never know how the tables would turn. But overall, we have massive consequences that we are beginning to sample as the news unravels in front of our eyes in Greece, 
and other locations and uh, California, Canada recently where Francis experienced it as well. So overall, this is the truth. This is happening. This is almost urgent, even though we don't see it uh, looking out of the window. And this tool as a simulator is a strong scientific instrument to help us identify what can pra practically be done, hopefully by governments and local authorities and local governments to actually begin to do something about it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, before we go into it, David, can I just say that um, if any of you want to play with it, I'd put the link up to the actual simulator in the chat. If you want to play with it between now and X time in the future and come up with some questions about the simulator, then we'll look mm -hmm. at how we can take it forward. If you play with all the variables, it's really interesting. We've only looked at one today, but as Ali explained, there are a lot of sections and they all have different variables within it. So if you could play with that and look at it, um, then that would be important. And then what we'll do is try and take it further and we'll talk to some carbon literacy people like the Carbon Trust or Nottingham Trent University to see how then we can tailor it to specific and even local situations. So it's really a journey. It won't be done all at once, but we need to sort of play with it and see what we can do. Mm -hmm.